Let's look again at U.S. firearms laws, specifically laws about building firearms in the United States. This, of course, is for educational purposes. We always encourage you to do your own research. We're going to look at three major points in this video. The laws that cover building firearms in the U.S., how to build firearms, and why. Now, building firearms in the U.S. is covered by quite a few laws at the federal level. We've got the Second Amendment, of course, the 1934 National Firearms Act, the 1968 Gun Control Act, the Gun Owner Protection Act of 1986, more specifically the Hughes Amendment to that act, the 1988 Undetectable Firearms Act, and then we've got some concepts like 922R or sporting purposes, and then we've got state and local issues as well. We'll take a look at each of these briefly in this video, and then we've done videos on some of these, and we'll do videos in the future on each of these individually. But again, we're looking at federal laws now that have to do with building firearms in the United States. Now, federal laws, of course, we know apply to everyone in every state. Now, those are going to be things like registration, if we're talking about the National Firearms Act, regulation, if we're talking about things like the uh, 1968 Gun Control Act, also permitting, etc. The first federal firearms legislation, of course, was the Second Amendment to the Constitution. We have all are, are familiar with that one. It basically establishes the right to bear arms, which, in addition, would then give us the right to use, maintain, repair, invent, and manufacture those firearms. The 1934 National Firearms Act uh, did quite a few things. It imposed a tax on the manufacture and transfer of certain firearms, so it defined those firearms. We call them now the Title II firearms. We'll explain that in a, in a minute. Uh, it also uh, defined uh, the first federal firearms laws and the uh, department that would enforce those laws, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. It basically also put penalties on violating these laws. It also restricted some importation. The next major federal firearms legislation that has to do with anything to do with building of firearms was the 1968 Gun Control Act. Again, it did quite a few things. Uh, it regulated the firearms industry and to some extent firearms owners. Uh, it did that by regulating interstate commerce in firearms. Uh, it increased the minimum age. It also created some uh, new law enforcement, which was later uh, removed. Uh, it created, or it became Title I of the U.S. Federal Firearms Laws, which made the 1934 Title II, and that's why we call uh, machine guns, short shotguns, and suppressors Title II firearms. Everything is enforced by the ATF, and so is the new uh, permitting and licensing uh, required by the 1968 Gun Control Act. The thing that's important for building firearms in the 19, one of the things that's important about for building firearms from the 1968 Gun Control Act is the sporting purpose test, uh, which had to do with importation of, fi of firearms, uh, but was also used and interpreted uh, in many different ways since then. Uh, it's also where we get the 10 restrictions on firearms ownership. Now, the Firearms Owners Protection Act of 1986 was another piece of national firearms legislation, and the Hughes Amendment to that act is the one that prohibited any new manufacturer of machine guns. The Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988 was created under the uh, fear of uh, plastic firearms, and it does affect the manufacturer of firearms to some extent. Now, 922R is a part, or it's a definition uh, that's re that's kind of established by multiple pieces of legislation, so it can be very confusing. Uh, it was basically created by the sporting purpose test, which was uh, necessitated by the 1968 Gun Control Act uh, by importing those rifles. Uh, it is further uh, regulates the assembly of firearms here in the U.S. that would be uh, regulated by importation. So again, it's sort of a default law uh, because we started to regulate what firearms could be imported. Uh, it also is defined by other state, other parts of the code. So again, it can be very difficult. Uh, what it all boils down to is it prohibits the building of any firearm which is not legal to import. Again, to try to put it in another light, 922R is Title 18, Chapter 4. 44 subsection 922 paragraph R of the United States Code. 
it required or it, it requires the 1968 Gun Control Act to exist. It requires that sporting purpose test in its definition. It, 922R references another section of U.S. Code, which then references the Internal Revenue Code, uh, and it is defined by another section of U.S. Code. So when people have trouble explaining what 922R is, hopefully this helps explain why that's so difficult to explain. To, to put it another way, if you were to assemble a firearm that would be imported or that had a restriction on importation, in other words, a firearm that could not be imported, and you wanted to build that firearm here in the United States from parts, you'd have to have a certain number of U.S. parts. And that's what all this is getting to. And this is a chart to give you some idea. Uh, for example, an AK-47 typically requires 10 out of 16 parts to be made in the U.S., where uh, if you look at this chart all the way to the right, an Uzi would require 10 out of 14 parts to be made here in the U.S. Again, that's only an issue when you're building a firearm that would not be legal for importation, so a firearm that does not lead us meet the sporting purpose test. Now, we've talked about firearms laws at the national level that apply everywhere, but there's also laws that apply at the state level, and these are pretty much all different between the states. Most of them, most of the states, don't offer any additional uh, registration or any, diff any additional restriction on manufacturer firearms. There are just a few states that do restrict manufacture. Of course, you're going to want to check your own individual state laws. Now, some states have gone further the other way to actually deny federal restrictions. And if we look at the Montana Firearms Freedom Act from 2009, we can see an example of the first one of those. It's basically state law that establishes firearms manufactured within the state that are to remain inside the state and used in the state are not, uh, are they are exempt from federal firearms regulation. And uh, there's been some dispute on that. It's actually still in the courts, but uh, this is basically telling us that some states are fighting back and saying that the federal government shouldn't have reg uh, let, uh, the ability to regulate firearms that are used within a state. Uh, it doesn't require anything with background checks, registration, or dealer licensing. Similar laws have already passed in quite a few states and have attempted uh, to go through in even more states. So if you live in one of those states, you might want to uh, try to find out the organizations that are pushing for this law and perhaps uh, look for it or pr help them out. Uh, it does not apply to uh, firearms that would be regulated under the National Firearms Act, 1934 National Firearms Act, basically full autos and suppressors, uh, because they don't want to uh, try to usurp federal law. They just want to stop federal law from infringing on states, uh, in inter interstate commerce. Next, we're going to look at uh, federal, or we've looked at federal laws, we've looked at state laws. Next, we're going to look at local laws. We're not going to really look too much at them because they're different everywhere. Just keep in mind that there may be actually local laws that restrict the manufacturer where they're not restricted at a state or, or federal level. Now, we've talked about uh, the laws that affect building, but how do you build a firearm? There are some things that you have to think about. Uh, as far as laws go, if you're going to make a firearm for profit, if you're going to sell the firearms to other people, you need to become a, fi a licensed d manufacturer, which is an, a type of an FFL, a federal firearms license. You're going to need to have, be aware of things like serial numbers, uh, bookkeeping, and that kind of thing. You may also need to, uh, or you might be required to have a business license, uh, some sort of building requirements for the actual building you're making the firearms in, also local taxes and things like that, uh, as well as any additional requirements such as liability or perhaps patents if you're building a firearm to sell to other people. Now, if you're building a firearm for personal use or for just a hobby, uh, at the federal level at least, there's few, actually hardly any re re restrictions on that or requirements, unless, of course, you're building something that falls under the definition of the 1934 National Firearms Act, the, the regulated firearms. As far as the how to build a firearm, you could assemble one from new parts, such as an AR-15, where you can buy all the parts brand new and simply assemble them. You could rebuild a, a, a firearm from a parts kit, such as an AK-47 or an FAL. 
Uh, you could rebuild, refurbish, or modify parts to build your own unique firearm. And then, of course, you can always start from scratch. Uh, we could go in on, into a lot of depth on how to build firearms. We just wanted to talk or touch on that here. As far as why we'd want to build a firearm, again, the tradition of building firearms goes back to the beginning of the United States. Uh, we've had a lot of innovation and innovation uh, here in the States as well. Uh, the skill set, the craftsmanship of building firearms, either if you're working with wood or with metal, there's a lot of skill and pride and achievement there. Of course, tackling new uh, challenges, innovation has always been, again, part of the uh, U.S. pride. Uh, we've got the ability to build a better firearm than you can get from a production line. You know, using only the highest quality parts, you can actually build a better firearm than you can buy in most cases. A lot of times, if you go the other way, uh, you can build one that's less expensive than maybe a typical off-the-shelf type of firearm. It's a lot of history in firearms. A lot of putting them back together can be great for a collector or historian. And then, of course, the, the security that you have when you're able to put together uh, your own firearms at low cost. Uh, you can afford to uh, buy either more ammunition or other supplies or more firearms to uh, can keep the family and homestead secure. And then, of course, fun. It's a lot of fun to put together firearms, and I'm sure I've missed things in this list, but you know we're allowed to just have fun sometimes, and building firearms and taking them out shooting is a lot of fun. What does the future hold? Is this all there is? No, of course it's not. Laws have changed. Uh, laws will change. Work towards getting rid of the laws that we don't like and work towards getting uh, basically laws taken off the books so we can do the things that we like to do and have fun. Uh, here's some links that we use to put this together. Ho hopefully we encourage uh, this encourages other people to put things like this together and things that they're passionate about. Get the information out there. That's how we uh, use the internet and things like this to our advantage. We always recommend that you, you support the organizations that support our freedom. Do your part to support the U.S. economy. Build a compliant firearm here in the U.S. We post information like this on our websites. We always thank you for your support. And as always, thanks for watching.